Good morning and welcome to the annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Commemoration and Award Ceremony. My name is Sarah Kooten and I serve as the Assistant Vice Provost of Students and Belonging at the UO Portland campus. It is my honor to serve as your host and kick off today's virtual MLK Commemoration and Award Ceremony. We are so grateful to be in virtual community with you this morning. This is our first time offering this program on both campuses. Thank you for joining us. Our theme for this year is Amplifying Voices for Racial Solidarity and Equity. Our intention is to build upon Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream of being in a solidarity as we seek justice, freedom, and liberation for those who are oppressed, marginalized, and unseen. To achieve this goal of solidarity, we must stand together. We acknowledge that we are unique and different. We should not try to avoid that truth, but together we can amplify our individual and collective goals. We can support one another and hold each other up. We can offer our love, authenticity, courage, and empathy. And together, we can build a more just and equitable future. Our program and honorees will embody this theme. Today's program features distinguished speakers, wonderful tributes from members of our campus community, and highlight our esteemed nominees and winners who embody the principles of Dr. King and are making meaningful and transformational contributions to our campus and community. Each year during the MLK commemoration, the Division of Equity and Inclusion celebrates UO faculty and staff whose contributions to our local campus and local community exemplify ideals espoused by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This year, we've made a few changes to the way in which we honor our nominees and awardees. We are thrilled to add new individual and group award categories this year, which highlight student and community successes, in addition to our previously established faculty and staff court categories. This year's program will honor awardees in six categories, which are the Social Justice Drum Major Award, Unsung Hero Award, Outstanding Student Influencer Award, Outstanding Student Organization Award, Outstanding School Department Committee Award, and Outstanding Community Partner Award. We will share more about these in the awards ceremony later. At this time, I would like to invite my co-host, Jamar Bean, to introduce the first few elements of our program. Jamar? Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jamar Bean, and I serve as a program advisor for the Multicultural Center at the Eugene campus and a member of the campus and community engagement team in the Division of Equity and Inclusion. I'm delighted to serve as your co-host and lead us through our program today. First, I would like to invite those of you who are attending our virtual program to use the chat and kindly share your name, unit on campus, and which campus you are affiliated with. We might not be able to see you, but we certainly want to welcome everyone into community this morning. Please continue to use the chat throughout the program to share what comes up for you throughout the virtual event. Now, without further ado, we will get started and open our program with the land acknowledgement, morning blessing offered by Rabbi Mayer of Oregon Hillel and the singing of the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. The University of Oregon is located within the traditional homelands of the Southern Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to the Coast Reservation in Western Oregon. Today, Descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Sluts Indians of Oregon and continue to make important contributions to their communities at the UO and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. We express our respect for all federally recognized tribal nations of Oregon. This includes the Burns Paiute Tribe, the Confederated Tribes of the Coos, Lorumqua, and Sayusla Indians, the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon, the Confederated Tribes of Silette Indians of Oregon, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, the Coquel Indian Tribe, the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians, and the Klamath Tribes. We also express our respect for all other displaced indigenous people who call Oregon home. As 
the first conference on religion and race, the main participants were Pharaoh and Moses. Moses' words were, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. The outcome of that summit has not come to an end. The Pharaoh is not ready to capitulate. The Exodus began, but it is far from having been completed. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel presented this speech in 1963 when he met Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. at the Conference of the Churches and Synagogues on Religion and Race. Peace be upon both of them. Welcome to you, all of you, the holy members of the University of Oregon family to our celebration of Dr. King's life and mission. Today we focus on the essential theme of solidarity Solidarity is the commitment that your freedom is as precious as mine. Or, to quote Dr. King himself, we must live together as brothers or perish together as fools. The story of Dr. King and Dr. Heschel puts a human face on solidarity. In addition to leading the American struggle for justice and equality, the two men also became close friends. King made sure that Heschel marched in the front of the line alongside him, while Heschel included King in the fight to free the Jews of the Soviet Union from their anti-Semitic violence and oppression. Dr. Heschel described Dr. King as a living prophet, a compliment he did not mean as a metaphor. Our freedom, our meaning, and our very lives are dependent upon each other. Solidarity at its core means that it is our duty, every last one of us, to join together across differences. In fact, it is the only way we will ever achieve our goals. The world is not divided by race, by religion, or any binary system where some people are good and some are evil, where some are oppressors and some are the oppressed. Rather, as the ancient Jewish mystics called every human being an olam katan, a miniature world, each and every one of us is a mixture of good and evil, a human child with all the blessings and frailties unique to ourselves. By joining together, we elevate the best in each other. And ultimately, we elevate the best in our society. Only this way can we give flesh and blood to Dr. King's vision for our world. As the good Reverend famously said, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. Solidarity united Dr. King and Dr. Heschel in the dream. Solidarity unites us together in this same dream. So may it be. Amen. Another thing I want to say to you is, that hate isn't our weapon either. And I'm not talking now about a weak love. It would be nonsense to urge oppressed people to love their oppressors in an affectionate sense. I'm not talking about that. Too many people confuse the meaning of love when they go to criticizing the love ethic. I'm talking about a love that is so strong that it becomes a demanding love. I'm talking about a love that is so strong that it organizes itself into a mass movement. 
says somehow I am my brother's keeper and he's so wrong that I'm willing to suffer and die if necessary to get him right and to see that he's on the wrong way. and Catholic will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual free at last free at last thank God Almighty we are free at last thank you Rabbi Mayor for the blessing and thank you to the UO alumni group Floyd and Price for their beautiful rendition of the Black National Anthem Dr. Aris Hall is the coordinator of the Lily Reynolds Parker Black Cultural Center and will provide our opening remarks. Following Dr. Hall's opening remarks are tributes submitted by UO community members. Welcome to the 2022 celebration and commemoration of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at the University of Oregon. I am Dr. Aris Hall and the coordinator of the Lily Reynolds Parker Black Cultural Center here at the university. While we may be celebrating virtually again this year, it is imperative that we continue to recognize the importance of the Reverend Doctor's legacy, not only at the University of Oregon, but also within the United States and globally. The theme for this year's MLK commemoration and awards ceremony is Amplifying Voices for Racial Solidarity and Equity. When I first read the announcement of this year's theme, I had the question, what does that mean for the University of Oregon? And how will we move forward from amplifying those voices to listening and doing what we say we stand for as a university? Diversity, equity, and inclusion, social justice, intersectionality, and the list goes on are, are words that we use as a society. But as I have learned during this health crisis and uprising of racial injustice and hate, that oftentimes these words are meaningless without individual responsibility and collective action to fight against these injustices. Dr. King stated, you're not only responsible for what you say, but also for what you do not say. The solidarity goes beyond a Black Lives Matter sign in your office window or yard. It is when we advocate for our students, colleagues, and neighbors. We must do so by amplifying the voices who identify within these identity groups. Whether the injustice is pertaining to race, gender, sexual orientation, ability, class, or other marginalized identities, it is integral to our university, community, and society as a whole that we listen and learn from one another. Equity cannot occur unless we are willing to acknowledge these injustices and put forth the effort to work and fight together to rectify these systems in which these injustices have been able to thrive. And so I leave you with two things to consider as we remember Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy and all that the others that fought for our civil rights less than a century ago. First, the family of MLK said, that they would not informally celebrate this day unless the voting rights bill was passed in Congress. So as we celebrate, reflect, 
and commemorate, I stand in solidarity with them to advocate for the right to vote. I encourage you to do the same by contacting your Congress representatives for them to amplify the voices of many and protect the rights of our democracy. Next, reflect on your own advocacy and responsibility to amplify the marginalized voices in your, vo in your classrooms, departments, and communities. And then think of which of ways in which you can improve, change, or reimagine what you're doing to advocate for racial solidarity and equity on a day-to-day -day basis. Finally, remember these eloquent words that the late Bell Hooks wrote, what we do is more important than what we say or what we say we believe. So I ask you, what will you do to amplify voices for racial solidarity and equity? Hi, my name is Courtney Garcia, and I'm an academic and career advisor in Tyson Hall at U of O, and this is the dance group Azucar. <laughs> we perform Cuban salsa, and we wanted to perform a song for you all today for MLK. Uh, it's to the song La Raza by Alexander Abreu. Alexander wrote this song after the murder of George Floyd, and in the song he asks us all to look at each other, look at our humanity, rather than looking at, at the color of our skin. So not treating each other different based on the color of our skin, um, but seeing the humanity in us all. So we wanted to amplify the song and his voice and ask the same for all of you. So La Raza by Alexander Abreu. Thank you.
are so grateful to have you on our campus, Dr. Hall. Thank you for your thoughtful remarks. And what wonderful tributes reminding us of our humanity and love. Next, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Cherise Cheney. Dr. Cheney is an academic expert in African-American pop culture and how it relates to race, gender, and sexuality. At the University of Oregon, she's an associate professor and director of Black Studies. Her recent work focuses on the use of Black stereotypes, for example, Blackification by white artists in their music and videos. Dr. Cheney's book, Brothers Gonna Work It Out, Sexual Politics in the Golden Age of Rap Nationalism, examines the political expression of rap artists within the historical tradition of black nationalism. Dr. Cheney. Once a year, the nation turns its attention to a social justice icon and his political legacy. Martin Luther King Day offers a moment of reflection upon where we were, where we are, and where we want to go as a nation. These continue to be trying times for all. The global pandemic has exacted a devastating toll on BIPOC communities. Fatal violence against African descended people continues to be an epidemic within the pandemic, as does racialized gendered violence against indigenous women, women of African and Asian descent, black transgender women, and gender nonconforming people. Meanwhile, states' rights to disenfranchise black voters through racially targeted voter suppression laws are fortified by Congress's inability to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. Climate apartheid affects the lives of, and livelihood of BIPOC communities locally and globally. The list of racial violations goes on and on. This year's theme for MLK Day at UO is Amplifying Voices for Racial Solidarity and Equity. It invites us to shed light on the ways that marginalized and minoritized communities stage interventions on dehumanizing forces like white settler colonialism, white supremacy, or heteropatriarchy. Over the past 10 years in black communities throughout the US, political resistance emerged in the form of black activism, including the highly publicized Black Lives Matter, Say Her Name, and Me Too movements. On college campuses across the nation, black studies scholars have studied the historical legacies of the carceral state and engaged in debates over black sociology and blackness as social death. They have joined ethnic studies scholars to challenge the encroachment of conservatism and threats against academic inclusion in the name of critical race theory. Resistance to essentialized blackness is also evident in the work of black creatives like visual artists Kehinde Wiley and Kara Walker and musical artists like Lil Nas X and Megan Thee Stallion. As these examples show, the fight for social change and racial justice can be dissonant, diverse, and divergent. That is because black communities contain a multiplicity of experiences relative to ethnicity, gender, sexuality, generation, and region. For example, in my own research, I explore black conflict over Topeka's Jim Crow schools in the decades before Brown versus Board of Education. Many people are surprised to learn that most black Topekans preferred all black schools during the 1930s and 40s. When the Topeka NAACP began its desegregation campaign against the local school board in 1948, many black parents, educators, and alumni actively engaged in an obstruction of justice. In the historical shadow of Brown versus Board, black resistance to school integration occurred at one of the most surprising times in one of the most unsuspecting places. But it is important to note that Topeka's segregated elementary schools had comparable resources, equitable facilities, similar curricula, as well as compassionate, qualified, well-paid black faculty and administrators. Black elementary students had affirming educational experiences in all black schools, and transitioning into racially hostile, integrated classrooms was a legitimate cause for concern to black residents. Black black school advocates anticipated that the price paid for freedom was too high, so they fought vehemently to maintain all black schools. If it had not been for the resilience and resourcefulness of three local NAACP members, there would have been no Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka. The hidden history of blacks against Brown calls attention to the fact that people who have been racialized as black are not monolithic, nor are our political strategies. School integration did not signify racial progress for all African Americans during the Jim Crow era. In Topeka before Brown, there were conflicting definitions of educational justice. Proximity to whiteness was not the ultimate goal. It was a question of imagining a just black future. So it is important to complicate and broaden our understanding of the civil rights movement, including the person and politics of Martin Luther King. 
As important as it is to amplify the voices of black artists, activists, and intellectuals, I think it is also critical to shed light on the diverse emergences of whiteness. Here in the Pacific Northwest, histories of anti-blackness originated in a history without blackness. As the first state to be entered into the union with an exclusion clause, white racial subjectivities in Oregon evolved in the relative absence of black people. That racial legacy was evident in the violent eruptions that occurred in Eugene and Portland during the summer of 2020. The nation bore witness to a crisis of whiteness. Unlike other regions where whiteness has been dependent upon the distancing from black bodies, here it was manifest in white divisiveness over black bodies. As such, I am reminded of one of King's well-known quotes, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. As historian Ibram Kendi says, to effect change, we need anti-racist whites, not not racist whites. This fall, I was asked to write a response piece for the conversation. An 11-year-old in New York asked a question about white students' response to school integration. The answer, of course, is that it varied. For example, one of the most iconic photos of violent resistance to desegregation was taken at Central High School on September 4, 1957. Arkansas Democrat photographer Will Counts captured a 15-year-old white student named Hazel Brown yelling at a 15-year-old Elizabeth Eckford as she was walking away from school. The picture quickly spread through national news outlets and Brian became the symbolic face of Southern white racism. However, there's another lesser known story of whites' response to integrating black students that day. Perhaps more important than the collective of white students who mobilized outside of Central High School that day was the white majority who intentionally disengaged from the event. While Brian and her cohort became a public spectacle, the inaction of the silent white majority went unnoticed. Even sympathetic white students avoided assisting black students that day because it deemed, they deemed it too risky. One white student said she was ashamed of her peers' behavior outside of the school that September day, but that she, she did not want to get involved. Another student admitted that at the time, she was more interested in high school dances and athletic events than the emerging political storm. It was a privilege that was denied her new black classmates. As an adult, that student named Marsha Webb expressed regret for her unwillingness to intervene. In her words, she acknowledged that, quote, hurt can come from words, from silence even, from being just ignored, unquote. The more things change, the more they stay the same. George Floyd's murder in 2020 signaled another racial reckoning. Over 50 years after the murder of Martin Luther King Jr., extreme acts of racial violence present us with the challenge of squaring who we are with where we come from and where we want to go. Much like the second reconstruction of the 1960s, we are living in an historical moment of radical possibility. The catalyst for this moment is not only anti-black racism, but the collective action and creativity of black people in the United States. Hopefully, history will not repeat itself. We cannot afford to go backwards. As I have said multiple times in different forums, Generation Z gives me great hope. On the streets and through social media, many have stood up against white supremacy and white settler colonialism, patriarchy, homophobia, and transphobia. Those of us born in the 1900s can take some cues from these young rabble-rousers. We must weaponize self-interrogation and self-reflection into individual and collective resistance. For as Michelle Obama wrote in Becoming, it is one thing to get yourself out of a stuck place. It is another thing entirely to try to get the place itself unstuck. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cheney. In the next part of our program, we are excited to celebrate our amazing award nominees and winners. We would like to start by thanking all of those who took the time to write nominations to recognize our fellow students, faculty and staff, and community partners. It is important to note the heartfelt acknowledgments of seen and unseen efforts. Your nominations made it possible for us to host this awards ceremony, so thank you. We also want to acknowledge that we received many nominations across six award categories, and it was a very difficult decision for the group that reviewed the nominations. For this year's awards, there are six categories, including individual and group awards. The six categories are the Social Justice Drum Major Award. This award recognizes a faculty, staff, or scholar who has made significant contributions in improving access and opportunity for faculty, staff, and students on campus by dismantling barriers through putting in place policies, programs, or initiatives to enhance the opportunity and success for underrepresented populations.
The Unsung Hero Award. This award recognizes a faculty or staff member who gives freely of their time to advance the work of equity and inclusion in ways that reflect the elements of LACE, love, authenticity, courage, empathy, and works quietly but effectively for change through selfless service. The Outstanding Student Influencer Award. This award recognizes an undergraduate or graduate student who demonstrates outstanding commitment to social justice and serves as a change agent who has made tangible impact on the university and or local community through leadership, scholarship, service, or activism. The Outstanding Student Organization Award. This award recognizes a student organization that actively engages students, the campus community, and the local community to promote and facilitate dialogue and social engagement with and between diverse populations. The Outstanding School, Department, or Committee Award. This award recognizes a professional unit or group that demonstrates a consistent commitment to fostering an inclusive and equitable work environment through visionary insightful leadership, strategic decision-making, establishment of priorities, and allocation of resources. The Outstanding Community Partner Award. This award recognizes an outstanding community partner, either an individual or an organization that demonstrates exceptional achievement and commitment to promoting and practicing diversity, inclusion, equity, and access within the Eugene Springfield community or in partnership with the university. Now, finally, the moment you have been waiting for. Let's celebrate our nominees and winners. It was a pleasant surprise and an honor to be nominated and selected to receive this year's Martin Luther King Jr. Drum Major Award because I know how many individuals in our community are involved in this work. So I received this award in the spirit of representing the many who do small things uh, every day to follow this work and in honor of those who have been laying the groundwork long before I ever stepped in. Many of the conversations that I find myself in in this work boil down to a recognition of the big and the small of it all. Those big systemic and institutional changes that are related to making new and inclusive spaces and how those big changes compare to the small steps and the frequent self-reflection that advance that big work. The closer you are, the more you realize that much of that important work also occurs in those small decisions that we each make every day towards either creating that new and inclusive space or towards being an individual who can exist in it without breaking it again. Every stage, every step is critical, the big and the visible, the small and the quiet, all are necessary. So it is a little distant to receive an award when you know that the work is so not done uh, but I'm grateful for this opportunity to represent those many small steps that we take every day. Thank you. Good afternoon, I am Barbara Marbury and I serve as the Bridge Programs Coordinator in the Center for Multicultural Academic Excellence. Today I have the honor of sharing some of the comments sent in tribute to the work and essence of Dr. Nikki Cherry in support of her nominations for the 2022 Dr. Martin Luther King Unsung Heroes Award. From Dr. Shelley Kerr, Director of the UO Counseling Center. Everything that Dr. Cherry does is connected to her commitment to the diversity, equity and inclusion. She came to the University of Oregon as a staff therapist, now a licensed psychologist, and an African-American Black student specialist. This position only has about four hours per week dedicated to non-clinical work with African-American Black-identified students, faculty, and staff. Anyone who knows Nikki knows she was never going to be limited by the words on the position description. 
She spent countless hours going above and beyond in her specialist role. Dr. Cherry's expertise allowed us to provide culturally competent clinical services to students who had often, for understandable reasons, been reluctant to access counseling services. Dr. Cherry's impact comes less from developing her own programs and more important from her commitment to supporting colleagues' programs. Her schedule is full of what we call outside collaboration meetings. She is frequently called upon to provide advice, feedback, input, perspective by faculty, staff, students to support their programs. I have no doubt that Dr. Cherry's behind the scenes work results in amazing programs and services that never bear her name. It is really difficult to capture the true value of Dr. Nikki Cherry to the University of Oregon. When you know Nikki and watch her work, you just see that she radiates the essence of what we mean when we say aspire to uphold the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's hard to quantify and describe. It's a bit like oxygen or love. You know what it feels like or when it is there and when it is not. Dr. Kevin Marbury, Vice President for Student Life wrote, Dr. Cherry is so in genuine in her approach and that warmth lets our students know that she is a person that they can feel both safe with and place their confidence in going forward. This was particularly important to our young women of color who could now find an ally, not only in the time of crisis, but also had someone who was there to help recognize and celebrate their successes. From another nominator, Dr. Cherry has worked tirelessly to advocate for changes to policies and practices that create barriers to mental health care for BIPOC communities. Even though her current role involves more administrative duties, she still finds a way to serve the needs of our community and make herself available for outreach. The energy, passion, and dedication that Dr. Cherry shows for increasing access to mental health services for BIPOC students and all students goes way above professional duty. Even though Dr. Cherry is not here to speak for herself today, I know she is overwhelmed, humbled, and appreciative of this honor. Congratulations to Dr. Nikki Cherry. Good morning, everyone. I will start by expressing how extremely honored I am to be receiving the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Outstanding Student Influencer Award. Having been a student at the university for the past four years, I can safely say I never once anticipated being a recipient of this award. I can assure you of my shock and pride to be receiving it today. In the past several years here at the university, I have made a commitment to advocating and pushing for initiatives that changed how we define and offer higher education. Through these efforts, I've discovered how we as a community can preserve and bring about positive changes, even at the smallest of levels. Being an institution for higher education has shown me how systemic inequalities can be are best solved through collective actions. I began my work fighting for increased funding towards dismantling the financial bar barriers that might prevent students from succeeding in the pursuits. And now I am proud to say that we as a community provide several services that further support our most underrepresented students. As I enter into one of my final quarters here at the university, I hope to continue to bring about a positive change for those that are most underrepresented. I'm earnestly grateful for the recognition I received for my work I'd like to thank the Division of Equity and Inclusion for bestowing me this award, and I'd like to thank my mentors, advisors, and peers for supporting me and encouraging me to get this far. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and Happy New Year to you all. My name is Cornisha Tweed. I'm currently a fourth-year PhD candidate within the Romance Languages Department. This year, 2022, I received the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Student Outstanding Student Influencer Award. It gives me great pleasure. I'm honored. I'm just elated to be able to have received this award. I'm just grateful for whoever nominated me or my nominees uh, for this wonderful feat um, and milestone I believe in my life. I'm just so grateful to be able to be part of Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy and to be able to say uh, the award that I received in his name. I'm so grateful for the seeds that he planted um, in our community, in the world, on our campus, and also what he has planted in me, because I'm so grateful for the fruit that we see from it, the harvest that he planted. And I wanna be a part of that legacy. I wanna be a part of uh, planting seeds and making a difference and influencing people on a, on a positive level. So it gives me great pleasure to be able to have received this award. I'm just so grateful to all, and I'm just so thankful. Have a happy new year, guys, take care.
My favorite APASU memory is one of our meetings discussing Asian hate. We all got together to sing karaoke. The apple picking event. The Halloween meeting. The fall reception event. At APASU, we explore issues directly and indirectly affecting Asian Americans, as well as include a safe and inclusive environment for students to have a discourse. We also have meetings revolving around social justice, where we learn about issues revolving around our community, the ADPI community, as well as communities outside of our own. APASU is a second family to me, and it's nice building those connections with other Asian American students. We really appreciate having APASU nominated and awarded the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Outstanding Student Organization Award. I'm very thankful and grateful to receive this award. I'm so appreciative and honored that APASU has been given this great award. I'm looking forward to continuing to cultivate this community on campus. We are always super duper grateful and just thank you so much. Hello, we are some of the members of the University of Oregon's Search Advocate Pilot Program. Before we share our thanks with you, we'd like to take a brief moment to share what search advocacy is. Search advocacy relies on search advocates who are trained to support search committees in recognizing and minimizing cognitive and structural biases and to identify and promote practices that advance diversity and social justice. On this day of remembering Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we thank you for this recognition of the program's work. We are deeply honored by this award and on behalf of the Search Advocate Pilot Program and these honorees, as well as the program's participants. We would like to share with you why we became Search Advocates. I became a Search Advocate because... as well as our colleagues who could not be with us for this presentation today. Members of our university community, we hope you'll consider becoming a search advocate. And finally, thank you to Dr. Charlotte Moots Gallagher for her leadership. And thank you to all of you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Michelle Jacob. I'm a member of the Yakima Nation, Professor of Indigenous Studies, and co-director of the Subsequent Lab Program at the University of Oregon. And it is my honor to share with you a little bit about the important work of our Subsequent Lab Tribal Advisory Council, who is being honored with the 2022 Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Outstanding Community Partner Award. All of our work at the Subsequesla Tribal Advisory Council is guided by our motto for our program, which was gifted to us by tribal elders at Yakima in Warm Springs. And that motto is Subsequestui Nami Tanama Miao, and that translates to Education Strengthens Our People. Here are the members of our Tribal Advisory Council. We're so honored that these education leaders from their tribal nations step forward to donate their time to serve on our tribal advisory council. Our Subsequesla program operates as a consortium with the nine federally recognized tribal nations in the state of Oregon. And through this beautiful work, we come together and all year long work to support indigenous students and to really live and practice 
the importance of Indigenous self-determination in education. Our Tribal Advisory Council members uh, help us to determine our admissions criteria, admissions decisions, funding allocation, policy development, placement, recruitment, as well as to work side by side with us and guide us on all of the work that we're doing to change uh, policy at the state level with regard to teacher licensure to make sure that all policies are really honoring Indigenous ways of knowing and being. And so we're really proud of this work. It's a tremendous model that we're offering uh, for all of higher education. So often diversity initiatives have a way of being framed as we're going to help those people who need this help to succeed. And we're doing something different. We're instead honoring and affirming the importance of Indigenous ways of knowing and being, bringing Indigenous education leaders to the table to help guide our work at the University of Oregon. And this work has tremendous outcomes. We're the only program that every year we recruit Indigenous graduate students, retain them, they graduate, we place them in jobs and then support them through an induction process. And we do that all year long as we are a 12 month program. We're so proud of our 103 alumni from 49 different tribal nations, all of whom have gone on to serve indigenous youth as educators. And so thank you for allowing me to share a little bit about the important work of our tribal advisory council and for honoring them um, with this amazing award. Congratulations to all the nominees and winners. It is so humbling to hear about your contributions and important work that is being done in our campus and local community. Thank you. As we near the end of our program, I have one last speaker to introduce. Our next speaker is Isaiah Allen, a fourth year student studying sociology and ethnic studies. Isaiah? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Isaiah Allen. I'm a senior at University of Oregon, and I'm double majoring in sociology and ethnic studies. I'm also a second year associate at the Black Cultural Center here on campus. As we all know, Dr. King advocated for equality. A line from his I Have a Dream speech states, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. To continue Dr. King's dream, we must think beyond equality. Instead, we should think about equity. The difference between the two is everyone is purposely not treated equally with equity. An example that demonstrates this, imagine there's a six foot tall fence with a single box placed at the base. Now dad is 6'3", so he doesn't need a box to see over. Mom is 5'9", so one box is perfect for her. And poor little Johnny can't see over the fence at all because he's only four feet tall. Here, everyone's treated equally with one box. However, if they were treated equitably, little Johnny would be given two or three boxes and dad wouldn't need a box at all. To reach Dr. King's dream of equality, we must first all be treated equitably. Now, I wanted to unlock a new thought process in everyone's mind, but I also want to leave you all here today with something that you can actively do in your community. Since this is a more of a institutional issue that will require long-term changes. Instead, I leave you all with the challenge that can be done today. Before the day is over, I'd like you all to Google Black-owned businesses near me, and you may be surprised that somewhere you shop often is Black-owned. And for those who respond with, oh, I don't want to spend any money, I have another challenge for you all. Before you go to bed tonight, Google say their names and pick a few people. Now I want you all to say their names out loud and send some prayers for them and their loved ones. Reading and learning about black culture is an important step to truly understanding what we are all fighting for. Doing things like reposting on social media is only half the battle. 
It is on you and no one else to educate yourself on social issues and use that information to take a stance. I conclude, I conclude by reminding you all today with another quote from Dr. King. You're, you are not only responsible for what you say, but also for what you do not say. Thank you everyone for attending and I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Isaiah, for calling us to action and reminding us that actions speak louder than words. I'm sad to say that we are at the end of our program, but this should not be the end of honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and fighting against injustice. At the close of our program, we'll share information in the chat about upcoming opportunities for the official observance of MLK Day on January 17th. Please spend a few minutes at the conclusion of the program to make a note and remember, MLK is a day of service, a day on and not a day off. As we transition into our next event for MLK Day, Courageous Conversations, which will focus on the theme of solidarity, we hope you will carry our speaker's call to action with you. For our guests who pre-registered, we look forward to seeing you virtually at 1 p.m. If this is your first time hearing about the University of Oregon's Courageous Conversations, it is a dialogue series intended to create authentic and civil spaces for discussions around current events centered on social and racial justice. We invite you to visit the DEI website and sign up for our mailing list to receive notifications for future events. We also have special MLK swag that we hope you will enjoy. If you are currently attending one of the in-person watch parties, please visit the swag table on your way out. For folks in the virtual room, we have several pickup locations, both Eugene and Portland campuses, if you would like to stop by for some swag. There will be masks, hand sanitizers, and beanies. Please visit the Division of Equity and Inclusion's MLK website for more information about pickup locations. Finally, we express our sincere gratitude to all who presented and contributed to this special experience. We are truly thankful for your time, talent, and heart making this experience possible. A big thank you to the UO communications team who provided creative direction and supported our vision. Also, we want to thank University Catering and the Scheduling and Event Services team for your partnership to make sure our watch party attendees are safe. And a most special thank you to our inaugural MLK Planning Committee and the DEI Campus and Community Engagement Team. We are so grateful for your contributions and dedication from last spring term until now. We cannot thank you enough for helping to bring this year's vision to life. Thank you to all who joined us for our program today. We hope you and your loved ones stay safe and well and please take care of one another. And remember, MLK every day. Thank you, we hope to see you again soon.